Okay, it is noon Eastern and we have a lot to cover, so I'm gonna get us started right away. I'm sure some more people will be trickling in. Uh, but again, my name is David Dodge. I'm the executive editor of Gays With Kids. I use he and him pronouns. Very excited to have everyone here today. Uh, we're gonna be going through a lot of detail on how to build the best surrogacy team possible to help you throughout your journey. These are the people that are really gonna be guiding you from start to finish to make sure you have the most um, positive experience possible. Um, so just before I hand it over to our uh, great presenters, I'd just like to give a little bit of a spiel about Gays With Kids, who we are, uh, just in case this is your first time interacting with us. Um, so we got started about seven years ago, mostly just as a website and an Instagram page, um, a place for us to try to help increase the visibility of gay, bi, and trans uh, dads and people who want to become dads. The idea behind it was to try to help others who are interested in fatherhood show that it's possible despite the many hurdles that are often put in our way um, in order to navigate the uh, path to, uh, to fatherhood that are available to us, these namely being adoption, foster care, surrogacy, parenting partnerships. Um, and as you um, already know, or you wouldn't be on this webinar, these are all complicated paths and they have um, a lot of different steps, often take a lot of time and resources. Um, and you often need experts like those you'll hear from today to really help you through the journey and to make it as positive as possible. Um, so what we learned though, as, as we started to grow and as our following online uh, to explode is that we uh, have done a really good job inspiring people and letting people know that being a father is possible. Uh, if you were a gay, bi and trans man, something that a lot of us didn't think was within our reach uh, when we were growing up. Um, but we weren't doing a great job kind of connecting people to the experts that needed to help guide you along those ways. So people were happy to be inspired, but they wanted more. They want to know who they can turn to, what agency they, they can go to, how to make the decision between uh, agencies or to go the adoption route or the surrogacy route. Um, so for the last year and a half, we've really been scouring the country to find um, experts in each of these paths to, to fatherhood um, that not only have um, uh, an expertise in the area of their uh, particular paths, but also a passion for helping build uh, queer families. So we're very excited that we've been able to do that. We're very uh, excited about the teams that we have brought to you today. Um, and we're also very excited about this webinar series that we launched um, about a, actually about a year ago now. We, we can uh, thank COVID for that <laughs> to really kind of kick us uh, in the butt to start to get this information out to people to work with our experts to present the best possible information uh, to really cut from the moment that, um, you know, the idea of fatherhood enters your mind down to the decision point where you're going to go with this agency, this fertility clinic, uh, we're uh, very excited to be well down that path now. So this is actually the second time we've done this particular series on surrogacy. We did our first uh, last week that was going to a high level overview of the surrogacy process. So if you missed that one, um, it has been recorded. It's up on our website, gayswithkids.com, uh, as is every other um, uh, episode of this webinar series that goes into detail on everything from learning how to afford the surrogacy process to, um, to finding LGBTQ affirming uh, surrogacy partners. Um, so again, go to gayswithkids.com for a lot more information, but we have a lot to get to today. This um, webinar in particular um, is we're gonna go over the many experts that are involved in a surrogacy and IVF journey. We say this a lot here that, uh, that you know, people say it takes a, a village to raise a family, but for surrogacy it really does take one even to have one. Uh, but fortunately there are people that are very, again, experienced and eager to help you do that. Um, so, and again, you have a lot of choices when it comes to surrogacy and IVF, uh, but it's, these are really the people that are gonna make or break your journey that are gonna make it a good experience or uh, a less uh, good one. So this is, uh, this webinar really is intended to help you learn the questions to be asking these professionals to learn how to build the best team possible for your particular uh, unique set of circumstances. Um, and again, for us, it's really important to be working with professionals that um, not only uh, are LGBTQ friendly, but very competent and experienced and passionate about working with queer uh, men and helping them become dads. Uh, and then again, just how we can continue to help you and assist you on this path um, that you're about to go on. So before I turn it over to my experts, I'm gonna just very quickly introduce them. I'll let them go a little bit more into detail about their uh, particular organizations and expertise. Uh, but you're going to be hearing today from Sam Hyde, who's the president of Circle of Surrogacy. Uh, you're going to be hearing from doc Dr. Mark Leanderas, who's the founder, medical director, and partner of RMACT. Uh, Virginia Hart, who's the CEO of Art Risk Financial um, and Insurance Solutions. And Richard Vaughn, who's the founder of Inter uh, International Fertility Law Group. And each of these professionals are uh, very well equipped to be going through each of the different team members that we're going to be talking about here today. Um, so here generally, so... Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Sam Hyde actually, who's gonna walk us through the surrogacy process and then also jump into uh, walking through what a surrogacy agency does for us. 
Sure. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. My name is Sam Hyde. I'm the president uh, of Circle Surrogacy and one of the owners of the agency. I'm really glad to be spending some time together with you today. And you know, we've got a group of panelists here, I think, that represent um, some of the most knowledgeable people in the entire field uh, in their specific functions. Um, and so I think you guys are in for, for a treat um, with, with the group we have here. So the surrogacy process, you know, we've got six steps here on, on the screen. Uh, certainly a lot of um, sub steps within each of these, but just to go through it on a very broad basis. Uh, you know, the first step is you know, three kind of big decisions off the front or off the top, right? Um, first is choosing a great surrogacy agency to support you um, in your journey. Um, you know, I think Circle does a great job, but there are great agencies across the country that can help you uh, on that front. Um, if you do need the services of an egg donor, the second big choice is finding uh, an egg donor agency or, or, or an egg bank or working with a clinic that has an uh, egg donor program um, to support you on that front. Um, and then the third step is finding a great IVF clinic um, to support you as well. And so if you have those three parties, um, they should be able to help you through the journey, um, of course, with the help of insurance professionals and legal support, um, which we'll hear from in a little while that, that's needed as well. Uh, the second big, uh, the big uh, step there is decide on where, what the sperm source is gonna be and, and conduct the analysis. You can actually do step two and three kind of right at the same time. Uh, and step three is find you know, the other side of the biology that you need, which is an egg donor um, and create the embryos itself. So you know, the sperm source, that, that part of the process is fairly simple you know, um, and doesn't take that long. I would have in your mind on the egg donor side of things that you know, once you choose an egg donor, um, to go through all the processes required uh, to do the actual retrieval itself and to create the embryos you need. That process is going to take a little while. You know, have in your mind somewhere in the neighborhood of three to six months, um, depending on exactly what source of eggs you choose um, and if you choose to do genetic, genetic testing and, and things like that. I'm sure Dr. Leonderos will talk a little bit about that um, in a moment. Uh, the fourth step, which I think is the one everybody has right at the top of their mind, is matching with a great carrier. Um, that's going to be the responsibility of the surrogacy agency that you choose to support you um, in your journey. Um, and that process itself will take a little while. It'll take some phone calls. It'll take some back and forth with the agency and the surrogate herself and often the surrogate's family as well um, to make sure that you feel a real nice, um, you know, transparent, honest, supportive match um, with your carrier. I think a lot of people feel like once I complete step four, you know, I'm going to do step four on Friday and I'm going to do step five on Monday, right? I'm going to, we're going to go right to the embryo transfer and, and, and get there. You know, have in your mind that it's going to take a little bit of time to go from step four to step five um, because you need to engage with, you know, a couple of the professionals we have here on the phone today. You need to do first your legal work, um, which is, you know, drafting up uh, and signing a care agreement uh, between your surrogate um, and yourself that will guide the remainder of your journey from a legal perspective. Um, you need to make sure we have great insurance in place. Uh, Virginia will talk about that in a little while. And we need to work closely um, with the IVF clinic itself to set the cycle calendar um, to make sure we're transferring that embryo at the perfect ideal time um, to maximize our chance for success. Um, you know, when you're working with a great clinic uh, like Dr. Leanderis, you, know, you should expect that embryo transfer. You're going to end up having success you know, 65, 75% of the time, something like that. I think actually circle, we're actually a little bit above um, that, that, uh, that metric, but it, you know, more times than not, you're going to come out with a successful pregnancy. Um, that's obviously step five to step six, uh, is hopefully, you know, fingers crossed for everybody, um, a nine month process, uh, to, uh, to complete your pregnancy. Um, and during that, that's really the time to get to know your surrogate at a really deep level, talking to her on a weekly basis, talking to her family. You know, if you have the ability to travel and meet with her, um, in person once or twice and go to, uh, go to an OB appointment and go to an ultrasound. Uh, those can be really great events um, to start to build that foundation of trust and, and a relationship that I think is so important in these journeys. Um, and then you're at step six or, you know, I think maybe step seven there was the actual birth itself, um, which is obviously an incredibly exciting event um, where you get to hold your baby for the first time uh, and really get to start off on your, your path to parenthood. So very high level overview. Um, there's a ton of a ton of folks that are gonna you're gonna intersect with during this uh, journey, which we'll hear from today. Um, but uh, this kind of gives you just a real nice snapshot of, of what the process looks like. Thank you, Sam. So again, yes, each of, this is a complicated journey. We just like to give a little uh, bird's eye view of the entire process. 
before we dig into one particular aspect of this journey, which today is this first step, finding LGBTQ competent surrogacy professionals that are going to guide you throughout the rest of this and make it as seamless as possible. Uh, thank you for that overview, Sam. Um, also, I forgot to mention that if you have a question at any point during this uh, webinar, and again, we're going through a lot of information, we're going through it quickly, uh, feel free to ask questions as they occur to you using the Q&A function of your uh, Zoom screen, or if you're joining us on YouTube Live, feel free, or sorry, Facebook Live, feel free to ask comments in the uh, questions in the comments there. I'll be collecting them throughout the um, whole webinar. We'll, we'll reserve a good 25 to 30 minutes at the end to get through as many of those as we can. Um, if we're unable to get to your question or if we can't answer it sufficiently, um, I'll also repeat this email several times. Feel free to email us at dads at gayswithkids.com and we'll make sure one of our experts gets back to you um, as soon as they can. Um, okay, so with that, we're going to jump into our first uh, team ex uh, part of the surrogacy team, um, and that's going to be surrogacy and IVF professionals. Oh, I'm sorry. No, one more. Right, so these are, again, this is, we're going to be hearing from each of these team members throughout the rest of this webinar. So the, uh, the five team members you're, um, that you're going to be uh, needing to worry about um, in your journey are a reproductive endocrinologist, a reproductive attorney, a mental health expert, insurance experts, and caseworkers. So again, uh, we're going to hear a lot about each of these, so we're not going to dwell on uh, this particular slide. And I'm going to let Sam take it away on how to pick a surrogacy agency. Thanks, David. Yeah, so I'll kick us off here on, on surrogacy agency. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any, I talked a moment ago about, you know, the three kind of big decisions you need to make up front, you know, egg donor agency, surrogacy agency, um, IVF clinic. You don't need to make all of those right at the same time. Um, you know, a lot of clients come to us having already picked an IVF clinic. Um, or already picked an egg donor, and we're just here for surrogacy. Conversely, sometimes we get people come to us first, um, and then they pick a clinic or a donor agency later. So there's there's no specific order uh, to make these decisions. But when you're picking an agency, um, I think the first thing that's important is understanding what is the agency actually going to do for you um, for your journey. Uh, not every agency does the same types of services or the the same set of services for your journey. Um, there's a lot of agencies that will say they're kind of a full service agency, but when you dive under the hood, that's actually not the case. And so you wanna make sure you have a good understanding of the agency that you're picking, what are they actually gonna complete for you during your journey? And so let's talk about you know, five things that an agency may or may not do. The first is obviously matching services. I think anybody who calls themselves a surrogacy agency is gonna do this specific piece of the job. Uh, this is really about finding a great carrier for you um, that meets the criteria you're looking for, the right geography, um, the right personality, the right timing, uh, any medical characteristics you're interested in, you know, will she carry twins, will she not? Um, and there's a lot of work that goes into this, right? There's First, we have to find a great number of potential carriers and screen them down um, based on our own internal criteria to make sure that we're setting you up for success. Um, every agency has slightly different criteria with what they're looking for um, from, uh, from a potential surrogate. Um, a lot of the good agencies have six, you know, uh, acceptance rates somewhere in the one to two to 3% range. Um, and so it's a good question to ask uh, your agency when you, when you start thinking about that. The other thing to ask on the screening front is, is your agency gonna do the screening services before you match with that carrier uh, or after you match with that carrier? Uh, a lot of the good agencies in the country will do the majority of the screening well before you match with her. Um, so they're setting you up for success. They're setting you up to meet somebody that they believe is going to be able to progress through, through the journey. Um, and then once you're matched, the other kind of half of this matching services is once you're matched, just kind of you know, monitoring that match and support um, throughout your journey uh, to, to make sure you get to the finish line from a coordination perspective. Um, very, very important that you know, you know once, once you match, what happens next? Do they stick with you? Do they not? Uh, second bullet on here, I won't beleaguer this point too much because we've got, I think, truly probably the, the, the most accomplished expert in this field uh, on the call today with Virginia Hart. Um, but you want to make sure you have great insurance support for your journey. Um, you know, for our domestic parents, uh, you know, the, we're talking about maternity care in this case. So the surrogates own health care during the journey. Most of the time for our domestic parents, once the baby's born, that will actually go on your insurance. Um, for our international parents, we need to worry about both maternity care during the journey and coverage for the newborn uh, once the baby is born. There is a ton of complexity within the insurance piece and a ton of variability in the cost um, associated with it. So I'll let uh, someone who understands it much better, Virginia, get into that in a few minutes. Um, third bullet, also critically important for your journey, you want to make sure you know, is your agency doing the legal services in-house for you? Um, are they working with a third-party attorney? Um, you know, 
I'm going to say this a lot. We've got Rich Vaughn on the call, who is probably one of the most knowledgeable surrogacy lawyers on the planet. Um, and so if you work with someone like Rich, you know, you can work with a great agency as well. Um, Rich will take care of the legal side of things, where the agency is going to take care of some of the other bullets here. Um, do not uh, skimp on the legal services. You want to make sure that you understand uh, both the state, the state-specific legal requirements um, of uh, you know how the match has to unfold and how uh, the journey has to unfold. New York, for instance, has a lot of criteria around how that match works and, and who can represent who. And then you also want to make sure you know how the parentage work is going to be done um, at the end of the journey. Is it a pre-birth order, post-birth order, second parent adoption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so very, very critical. You have great legal support uh, on this front. Uh, fourth bullet is, a, is one that a lot of agencies will do. It's certainly something that Circle prides itself on, uh, which is mental health support during your journey. So uh, these are stressful journeys. These are complex journeys. Uh, they do not all go perfectly. I think everybody on this call uh, can share a myriad of different stories about times in which things did not unfold exactly the way we wanted it to unfold. We're talking about fertility. We're talking about you know, different parents and, and families intersecting um, at the nexus of you know, fertility, family, and money, which is a, a, you know, three, three things that cause stress in people's lives uh, a lot. And so you know, having an agency that has mental health support in-house or has access to mental health support for you is very, very important uh, so that you have someone to talk to when things get stressful, if you have friction with your surrogate, if you, you know, have a bump in the road, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, that mental health support is, is critically important. Um, and then the, the fifth bullet, um, also uh, extremely critical for your journey, make sure that you know how the agency is holding your funds uh, for your journey. All good agencies in the country um, are holding those funds in a bonded escrow or an IOLTA account um, and distributing them only based on the, the terms of the carrier agreement uh, that you'll sign. Uh, there have been instances in the past where small agencies did not do this correctly um, and screwed up the funds or absconded with the funds even worse. Um, and so make sure you have a critical understanding of, of how your agency is managing your money. Um, you know, things to ask about, you know, these are, you know, now you understand kind of what the agencies do from a broad perspective. You, you, you know, you figure out, okay, these couple different agencies I'm thinking of interviewing, these people do these services, these people do these other services. You know, what are the questions you should actually ask um, each specific agency during the journey? Uh, first one, experience and success. Um, you know, there are a group of agencies in this country that have been around uh, for many, many, many years who have had literally thousands of babies born through their programs. Um, and then there are a group of agencies that are very, very new um, that have popped up in the last two to three to four years. Um, that's not to say you're going to have a bad experience at those agencies. I just think they have less of a track record or less of a backstop of experience to draw on um, if you do end up having kind of a bump in the road, so to speak. The second piece of this bullet I think is critically important, success rates. Uh, unlike our colleagues on the IVF side who have a very robust um, tracking system and you know, national organizations that track the success um, of their IVF cycles, the same does not exist on the surrogacy agency side, unfortunately. I think it's a, a, a real opportunity for our field to, to push the ball forward on defining what success looks like for each of these journeys. Um, Circle, for instance, we have our success rates audited by a third party, um, and we post them on our website. Uh, one of the few agencies that does that, I wish more would, uh, because you really want to know, uh, has your agency had a track record of success in the past? Uh, the team of staff, also super important. Um, you know, at small agencies, you're going to find many individuals wear uh, quite a few different hats each, right? The same person who might be giving you insurance support might also be the person that's doing the screening on the surrogate. Um, there are a number of big agencies in the country who have a team uh, where you know, people are true experts in their vertical. And so they're not an inch deep and a mile wide, they're a mile deep um, and an inch or two wide, right? And I think that type of experience is really going to make a difference. That type of expertise on the staff is really going to make a difference um, if you do have a bump in the road along the way. Um, we've seen a lot of different journeys unfold. We have a lot of experience in, uh, that we can draw from as, as a team. Communication style is really going to be something that we want you to help guide us on. Uh, what do you prefer? Do you prefer email? Do you prefer text? Do you prefer phone call, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and so you know, be upfront with your agency about what you expect from them from a communication style. We have some parents that come to us that it's very important to them that you know, they get a reply in a certain number of hours uh, because that's kind of how they run their life. Other people, you know, not quite as uh, you know, not quite as worried about stuff like that. 
Um, so the more you can share with your agency, both about your communication style with the agency and your communication style, your desired communication style with your surrogate, um, the better journey you're likely to have. LGBTQ uh, inclusivity, uh, obviously very apropos for the, the topic that we have today with, with gays with kids. Um, uh, like I've said on some of these other points, there's a number of agencies out here um, who have a real track record um, with the community. Circle, for instance, founded by a gentleman named John Weltman, uh, who founded Circle with his husband, Cliff, uh, who have two boys through surrogacy who are now both you know, 26 and 28. Um, and so it's been a pillar of our, uh, our uh, support for 25 years, um, and about half of our clients are LGBTQ+. Last bullet, um, it, certainly top of mind for many, many people as they come into this journey is how much is this going to cost? <laughs> These are expensive. Uh, expensive journeys. Um, and I think you want to have a very clear understanding of what you are signing up for uh, with this, each specific agency. Unfortunately, a lot of agencies have long cost sheets with lots of different numbers and ranges um, and things like that. You're not sure if you need the service. If you do need it, you're not sure how much it's going to cost. Um, and so really push your agency to help define what is the average cost that I should expect. Um, there are a couple agencies out there like Circle that have a fixed cost program, which will, we will tell you exactly how much you will pay and that is how much you will pay. Um, but you want to understand kind of what you're signing up for um, from a cost perspective. So um, I could talk about this subject for like another hour, um, but uh, I hope this gives you a, a kind of a high level overview. Uh, I'd obviously love to chat in person down the road um, if it's helpful. Thank you so much, Sam. And I'll just remind everyone that this is being recorded in case you want to uh, go back and re-listen to anything Sam just said. We have a ton of great information about picking an agency on our website, gazewithkids.com. Uh, and if you've had any questions about any of this, if your head's spinning a little bit, <laughs> I don't blame you. Please uh, do ask a question using the Q&A function of your screen. You can chat me privately as well if you prefer to do it that way or leave a comment in uh, the Facebook Live. Yeah, sorry, um, I talked okay. very fast. Hopefully, Mark will talk. No, <laughs> <laughs> no it's, we're packing a lot of inf information into yeah. a little bit of time, so uh, no problem at all. So, okay, now we're going to go uh, through how to pick a, for, uh, a fertility center with Dr. Mark Linderis. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, so in seven minutes, I'm going to talk about this magical science that has generated over eight million children called in, in vitro fertilization. And as a uh, as as a dad to be, you're going to embark on the most complicated fertility cycle known to humanity. And uh, um, it's your reproductive endocrinologist and the IVF clinic, the nurses, the high tech dream makers and the embryology lab that are going to help you do that. Um, so, you know, a reproductive endocrinologist is kind of like a, a, a nerdy doctor, which I realize that's kind of seems like God, it goes with the case. But um, I spent four years delivering babies, three years doing a fellowship and uh, um, and then um, had to go complete my two sets of tests just to get started. So we are right outside of New York City. Um, my practice is about 80% gay men. We've done over 800 transfers into surrogates. We have proven track records, or track records and proven success rates that are available um, on, on national websites, which I can guide you. And I think that uh, this takes a village thing is real. You know, I'm a dad through egg donation and surrogacy. Thank you, Flea. I have two kids at this point in time that are, um, you know, are nine and seven. So they're, so they're big kids. But I remember, like, why do I need all these people to, to help help uh, help you? And I think throwing we don't have a mental health professional on uh, on the talk here, but they are going to be essential in counseling you counseling your donor and counseling your surrogate. So I'm going to throw throw that out for you guys all to remember that you're going to that they are very important to the process. But the uh, um, reproductive endocrinologist and their associated IVF clinic are the magic that helps you have your baby. So, um, so what does uh, what happens at the fertility clinic? Well, number one, for dads to be, um, you know, I think it's really important to understand that that we have to evaluate you. So, we need to know that you have a normal sperm count, or if you have a very low sperm count, often we can work with you still because we don't need that many sperm. Um, the other part of the story is, is if you have no sperm, well, that could be evaluated. Sometimes that can be for medication or previous treatments, or that can be overcome with the help of a reproductive urologist. But we need to know who's going to be the genetic intended father, if it, you're partnered, whether it's one or both of you. And the other thing that's interesting out there, so in our genetic closet, um, most of us, 60 to 70 percent of us have some broken genes. And there's actually over a thousand mutations identified. We do a screen for over 502 
genes that are associated with diseases, things like you've heard of, like, like Tay-Sachs disease and cystic fibrosis and things you haven't heard of, like, you know, congenital adrenal hyperplasia or mucolipidosis type four. So we're going to screen you for these recessive genes. And then we're going to screen any egg donor you work with for these recessive genes. And we're going to make sure there's not a match. So you have this opportunity to kind of maximize the health and well-being of your future, future child. Um, we're also responsible, and I say this kind of with a sad voice, for basically being the firewall that says, no, you shouldn't use this donor, or no, you shouldn't use this surrogate. Maybe she's using substances she shouldn't. Maybe she has a sexually transmitted disease. Maybe her relationship is at risk. Maybe her uterus doesn't look healthy. Maybe she doesn't look like she has a good egg pool. Maybe she um, is not going to be able to use the medications properly for, for different reasons. So we are kind of the per people that say no a lot, and I feel bad about that. But how we maximize our success rates is by using a healthy sperm source, a healthy egg source, and a healthy uterus. PGT, those initials on there, pre-implantation genetic testing. Well, what the heck does that mean? So we all started as a one cell embryo that became an eight cell embryo, then became 150 to 300 cell embryo before we implanted into our uterus or our mother's uterus, so to say, if we can say it that way. Well, in this case, at that 100 to 350 cell stage, you can take a sample of five to 10 cells and you can screen that embryo for an extra chromosome or chromosomes, missing chromosomes or chromosomes. So thereby screening out Down syndrome and other chromosomal abnormalities that cause pregnancy loss or, or, uh, or, or children that, that, that uh, don't real, aren't able to like fully, fully be healthy as they move forward through their lives. Um, the other part of the story is, um, you know, it, it allows you the window into gender before you get there. Some people that's important to their family building picture. Um, so pre-implantation genetic testing also allows us to do other things like look for monogenetic diseases like cystic fibrosis, or perhaps you can look for structural rearrangement. So it's a, it's a really amazing technology where we biopsy the embryo before we put it in the uterus. Um, embryo creation is a, is a broad term for stimulating your egg donor, which is a seven to 12 day process. She has a, a small procedure where we retrieve the eggs. That day we take your FDA cleared sperm specimen or specimens, we put sperm and egg together. And then the embryos are in the laboratory in the dark in an incubator in a controlled environment being babysat by these high tech dream makers, embryologists and evaluated um, and tracked. And then eventually the best embryos are either tested and cryopreserved or perhaps transferred into the uterus of your surrogate. The most frequent pathway, probably 95% of the time is the embryos are, are cryopreserved, whether it's tested or not. And then we wait for your surrogate to come along. Your surrogate is an, is, is an essential you know, um, part of this process and it's a long-term relationship. So distinction between the donor who you might meet once and have a arm's length relationship, your surrogate, you're gonna to talk to weekly. We're gonna get ready for the embryo transfer by giving her a series of medications to thicken her lining. And then from there, we are going to um, do what's called an embryo transfer, which is a really delicate process where we use a like two millimeter soft catheter, place it into the uterine cavity and release your embryo. And that's like a moment in time. So, you know, I did um, four embryo transfers yesterday into uh, um, uh, um, dads to be, and, and we kind of marked that time as a point in their life that they've been waiting years for. Uh, Obviously, you know, we as a fertility practice can store embryos and store uh, for future children. So like my family was born from one egg donation and, and uh, both kids were quote unquote created at the same time, but they're 26 months apart. I'm trying to move right along here because I know we're a little bit short on time. So track record. So you should ask about clinic success rates and, and I can point you to where to look for clinic success rates. Team of staff, you know, um, and LGBTQ inclusively, inclusivity. You can look for um, branding from human rights campaign. You can look for branding from Family Equality Council. Um, obviously, I'm the medical director and the founder of this practice and I'm gay and I have a husband. So we have really worked hard to, for, to be LGBTQ inclusive. And team of staff, you know, a, a clinic that has a broad depth of experience in this is gonna have a separate team for third party reproduction and dads to be. Um, so you feel like you've got a, a good um, book, of, book of 
people behind you to back you up. The vast majority of your communication is going to be with your nurse and your patient navigator. Um, so there's a lot more to talk about, but I'm gonna um, pass the mental along in the interest of time. And uh, if you wanna be a parent, we can help you be a parent. The hurdles are surmountable. It takes time and tension, and, uh, um, but we can do it with you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much uh, to our self-described resident nerd, Dr. Leon Darris. <laughs> we'll pass it on to um, our insurance agency expert, uh, Virginia Hart. Go ahead, Virginia. Hi, so I'm Virginia Hart. I'm the CEO and founder of Art Risk Financial and Insurance Solutions. We have been working in the surrogacy world really since 2002, but uh, hardcore since about 2010. Um, it was just part of a business and then it became the business. So that's the evolution. If everybody, anybody wants a long drawn out story, I'll give it to you sometime. All right. So it's super important as you enter in a journey to understand what insurances you are going to need for that journey. And I'm going to direct you to our website, um, which is artriskSolutions.com. We have a wonderful wheel that will take you through the journey and all the insurances that you need during that journey, because I know we're compressed for time today. The coverages that you're going to need for your surrogate are going to include things such as insurance for the, the process, so for the transfer process, that's called recipient insurance. You're going to need a life insurance or an accidental death policy for her. You can also get loss of reproductive organ insurance. You can get loss of wage insurance or insurance that's going to cover child care or um, housekeeping if she is unable to do those tasks because she's been put on bed rest. You also are going to need medical insurance. What's going to cover the cost of her pregnancy? Sometimes surrogates have insurance that will cover that and that's awesome, but you need to have it vetted by an insurance professional to make sure it truly will cover. And you're, so if it won't, then there's other options available that are, that are cost effective. Um, and then you're going to need insurance to cover the baby. And your insurance often can cover the baby, but sometimes it can't. If you live in New York and you have an HMO and your baby is going to be born in Texas, we're going to have to talk to your insurance company. What will they do about it? So it's super important to understand that. And the costs vary. The, the biggest variation in cost is for the medical insurance for her pregnancy itself. If she has insurance that will cover a surrogate pregnancy, you might be, you're looking at deductibles and co-pays. And if she doesn't, you're looking at purchasing a plan, which could be between 10 and $15,000 on the open market. And if you can't find anything that works on the open market, then you're looking at a plan that's underwritten by Lloyd's of London, and there's two out there, and they basically cost the same. There's different variations. There's different way to play the game with Lloyd's of London, um, but you're looking honestly again somewhere between fifteen and thirty thousand dollars, depending upon how how we structure it. So that is a huge cost, and when you're looking for a surrogate, ask that question: What kind of insurance does she has? Is it surrogate friendly? Oh, can you find out? Um, for your egg donor, you're going to need to have recipient, I mean, I'm sorry, donor insurance, and that's going to cover her from the start date of medication through the transfer process and cover any complication that happens due to that transfer. Um, that's super important because they do have complications. They can get a thing called um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, or sometimes they're just super uncomfortable and think they're going to die, you know, because it's not a, it's not, I've never been an egg donor, but from what I hear, it can be unpleasant. Um, full disclosure. Um, and so, you know, you want to make that we want them to go get make sure that what they have isn't anything serious. So they're going to go get care, even if they didn't have a true complication. Um, so you want to make sure that's covered. You're also going to be responsible for paying should she lose her reproductive organs in the process, an ovary, a fallopian tube. So you want to make sure that you have coverage for that. And that can be added to the donor um, insurance. And then for your newborn, as we talked about it, you need to make sure that that newborn is covered. If you have health insurance, you have 30 days to add the baby to your plan, and it will backdate to the date that the baby was born. So you have coverage from minute one or second one. Um, if you don't have insurance, we can also get a plan through the Affordable Care Act because birth is a qualifying event. The baby can get insurance on its own. Um, but again, will it work out of state? And that is a super tricky question and one that I'm dealing with right now where they filed two appeals with an insurance company and the insurance company said, we're not covering it because it was your choice to have your baby born in Texas and you live in Ohio. So you have to really make, because those can be very expensive issues. 
Um, if it's a NICU visit, you're looking at, you know, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a day. If it's just a normal baby, you're looking at a couple of thousand dollars to spring it out, as I say, spring it out of the hospital. Um, I know with my babies, they wanted to make sure that we had insurance that would cover. And I said, what are you going to do, keep the baby? I mean, you know, no, they're not. But, you know, you will have to pay. So you just want to make sure that you have coverage for that because you don't. Our goal is to make sure that you understand what you're purchasing, that you are empowered to make decisions, and that your financial risks are protected. Because this process is crazy expensive and you don't need any surprises, right? Um, so what's included? Basically what's included in our consulting fee is we'll just guide you through the whole process. What do you need? Um, how can we help you? Um, we don't charge for the initial consultation. We actually would only charge a consulting fee if you're going to be using an ACA compliant plan. Um, and if not, then to talk to us, we'll talk to you all day long. And so what's included? Us. Um, and we are actually pretty good. Um, LGBTQ inclusivity, love is love is love is love is love. I am such a proponent of family and building families. And I just know I have three kids myself. And if I did not have them, my life would not be nearly as rich as it is, as many as great hairs as they have given me. And we will do anything possible to help people have a family. Um, the cost, the cost is going to be dependent upon what you need. Every journey is different. Every journey is unique. And that's why we want to talk to you and find out what do you need for your journey and how do we protect the risk? So, you know, the cost could be as little as you need a life insurance policy with um, a couple of add-ons. And that cost can be, you know, from $400 to $1,000, depending upon what you need. Donor insurance is about $250. Recipient insurance is about $250. Um, if you don't have to buy maternity insurance, you've just saved yourself a ton of money. Um, so every journey is unique. And therefore, every you know the, the price of the insurance is the price of the insurance. But what your total cost will be is super going to be dependent upon what you need. And we will guide you through that. We will never oversell you or ask you to buy something you do not need. Um, so, because we understand this is an expensive process and we want you to be able to afford it and we want you to be able to have a baby in your arms. That's our goal. And on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to, oh, and I'm just gonna direct you really quick back to our website because a lot of our information is there. So uh, artristsolutions.com. And now I'm gonna turn you over to Rich Vaughn who is an amazing attorney in this field and has all kinds of good information for you. Thank you, Virginia. Take it away, Richard. All right, thanks guys. Um, I will try to wrap up quickly so we have some time for Q&A. Uh, just a little bit first about me. I am a father with my husband of twins through surrogacy and egg donation. We started our journey in 2006. The kids were born in 2008. So now they are about 13 and all the joys of teenager, teenager dumb are about to um, come upon us. Um, I'm also the founder of um, International Fertility Law Group. It is a law firm that dates back to 1992, although I started in 2006. So we've literally helped thousands of people uh, throughout the last several decades uh, building their families. Um, my responsibility today is to help you understand how to pick a fertility attorney. And I think to know how to pick your attorney, it first helps to know what do we do? What do assisted reproduction lawyers do? So first of all, we help you in drafting and reviewing the relevant agreements. There are lots of contracts that you might be uh, working on or reviewing throughout this process. I'll list a few really quickly. You'll need a contract with your egg donor in most situations, not all. If you're working with a clinic, that has an in-house program and they have anonymous donors. Sometimes the clinics have their own uh, template agreements for that, but otherwise you'll probably need a lawyer to help you with an egg donor contract. You'll need a surrogacy contract. Um, if you are using donated embryos, you may need an embryo donation agreement, or after the completion of your journey, you may have leftover embryos that you wish to donate out to other people, um, in which case you need an embryo donation agreement. You may need some help reviewing an agency retainer agreement. Um, there might be a rare possibility that you might need a sperm donor agreement. Um, not as likely, but you know, I just wanted to give you the full spectrum of assisted reproductive agreements that you might come across. There also will be medical consent forms. Now, lawyers are not doctors, so we should not be reviewing the medical components of these medical consent forms, but the medical consent forms at the clinics 
will often contain some provisions that are quasi-legal as well, because they talk about what you want to have done with remaining embryos in the event of your death, or in the event of the dissolution of your relationship or divorce. So those are quasi-legal uh, provisions that might, you know, you might benefit from having a lawyer working with you on. Um, the other thing that some couples have us do is work on formal embryo disposition agreements between them so that they have put into their own contract what they want done with their remaining embryos in the event of death, divorce, dissolution of relationship, incapacity, etc. So that's the full range of some of the contractual agreements that you'll be looking at in this journey. Um, the other thing that lawyers do one of, one of the other things that lawyers do, some of them will actually hold attorney client trust accounts, or uh, these are sometimes referred to as escrow accounts. Um, you might, might need a master account to manage payments to donor, uh, to donor agencies, surrogacy agencies and clinics, where you can pay them directly. You might need a donor escrow account, a surrogacy escrow account, or the agency may have a specific preference of where they like to have the escrow accounts held for efficiency purposes. But if you need or want other options, your attorney may be able to provide this service for you. Just note that not all attorneys actually hold escrow accounts. So you can ask, but they may not provide that service. Um, your attorney will also be really important. This is the most instrumental piece really is, is protecting your parental rights. Now, a lot of this is done through the written agreements, but in a surrogacy, you ultimately must go to court and obtain a parental order, which can be obtained in some states. And, and we go to court in the state where the birth is occurring. And in some states, we can go to court during the pregnancy and get what we call a pre-birth order. But other states require that we go to court after the the delivery of the baby, and this is called a post-birth order. Now, the post-birth order or the pre-birth order, you know, at, at a minimum, they don't take effect until the baby is born. So the other thing that your attorney must do is help protect your parental rights to the greatest extent possible under the law during the pregnancy. The contract with your surrogate does not give you parental rights. It just establishes that you are the intended parents and she is not, and that she will cooperate with you in helping to confirm your parental rights, but there also are guardianship documents where the surrogate can designate you as a guardian of the baby during the pregnancy. And this gives you a healthcare power of attorney so that you can be involved in making medical decisions for the baby during the pregnancy and you can have direct access to the doctor because the doctor will view the patient, the surrogate as the patient, not you, even though the OB will understand that this is surrogacy, this is your baby, you're the parents, but technically you don't have any parental rights during the pregnancy. So a guardianship appointment is the best way to give you the equivalent of parental rights during pregnancy. Now, how do you pick a lawyer? These are the things that the lawyers do, but how do you pick? Um, obviously experience is important, the length of time that they have been in the field, uh, the number of cases that they've handled, what is their professionalism and what is their competency? Now, some of that you might not know just offhand, but you can ask questions and there are certain questions you can ask. You want to ask them, do they know the law and are they licensed in all of the relevant jurisdictions that might affect your journey? There are a lot of jurisdictions that could affect your journey. This, those jurisdictions are the state or country where you live, the state where the donor lives or country, if that's relevant, uh, the state where the surrogate lives and the state where the clinic is located. And you may not know at the beginning of your journey where your donor or surrogate are going to come from. So it's important to consult with a lawyer early who has a depth of knowledge in multiple jurisdictions, or at least if you do know who you're working with in, in terms of the donor or surrogate, they know the law in those relevant jurisdictions. Another question to ask is, do they work with your agency? Are they familiar with their agency? Do they work with lots of agencies or do they work for your agency? So some attorneys are actually in-house at the agency um, or they might be independent and there's not a right or wrong answer here for some people. And we've mentioned this earlier. I think Mark mentioned this. It does take a village um, for some people going to a, an agency that has everything in-house can help make that village a little bit smaller and more manageable. Um, again, there's no right or wrong. You have to pick what's gonna work best for you, but ask that question. You also wanna ask the attorney about the depth of their staff. Uh, what is their ability to get your work done in a timely manner? And who will you be working with? You might have a great consult with the owner of the company at the very beginning, and you may never talk to them again um, at the law firm. So find out who you're going to be working with and who's going to be involved in your case. And another question I think that's important to ask is, are 
is the attorney on a retainer throughout the entire journey? Or are they only retained for specific moments in time working on specific tasks, but not in between those tasks? You know, questions come up in your journey in between tasks. So you might wanna ask that question as well. And I think finally, of course, you know, we're here um, with Gays With Kids. The, the more important thing I think for all of us is, are they LGBTQIA plus competent? That's very important. Um, and if, you know, you have specific issues that, you know, an attorney can't handle because they have no competency in this area, then that might not be the right attorney for you. I think that's all I, I wanted to say. I um, hope I got it done on time. And now I think we may have time for Q&A. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you to each of my panelists who I'm going to invite to join me back on camera. I'm going to take us off our screen share so we can all have a conversation. Uh, thank you all for being as concise as humanly possible. <laughs> I know it's hard to uh, boil your entire expertise down to a good five to eight minutes, but uh, you all did an excellent job doing that. Uh, I think this may be our webinar where we pack the most information in, so I did let this run a little bit longer uh, and we'll have a little bit less time for Q&A, but I will just say up front that each of our experts here have very generously offered to um, give a 30-minute consultation to uh, the participants of this webinar. I will be putting the links into that at the end of this, so I uh, we will be able to get through much, many more of your questions uh, that way than we will, unfortunately, uh, right now in the, in the next 15 minutes that we have. Um, and so for the great Q&A questions that we've been getting in, I'm going to take the ones that kind of touch on each of these uh, areas of expertise uh, in some way. Um, starting with, uh, we got a lot of questions about how this works for international parents. So we have a, a dad joining us or a, dad, uh, a potential dad joining us from Canada and also from Spain. Um, and they're both interested to know how each of your areas of expertise work uh, when you're not in the U.S. and you're hoping to use um, a surrogacy uh, journey in the U.S. Um, why don't we start with the agency, Sam? Uh, you're still you. there. Yep, yep, yep. Um, you're good. Yeah, so from an agency perspective, you know, it is uh, fairly similar. Um, we do a lot of work for international parents. Um, there are some differences. Some agencies charge more for international parents, which I don't quite understand because the work is fairly similar. Um, mm -hmm. There's obviously some timing differences um, with, with time zones and whatnot, uh, but the real difference on the agency side is, is mostly gonna come from the legal perspective and the insurance perspective. So I'll actually probably say for the most part, we're good, but I think Virginia and, and Richard are uh, Richard are really no way on this one. Great, uh, so before, yeah, just from the clinic side, um, Dr. Leanderis, is there anything unusual or different about um, the process for international parents? Um, you know, the, probably the biggest difference with international parents is the COVID pandemic, which has made it very difficult to ship and receive sperm from outside the country or have the dads come here themselves and produce and cryopreserve an FDA cleared specimen. Um, all, the, the other part of the story just comes down to, you know, time zone problems that if I have an intended parent in Southeast Asia, it's really hard to get the consoles booked. Either they get up early or, or, or I, I get up early. But uh, um, a typical pathway for international intended parents is going to be that they're going to make, um, we're going to do consultations. They're going to make one trip to the New York metro area. We're going to um, have already know they have good sperm. We're already going to probably have done their genetics and they're going to cry, preserve their sperm, have a physical exam, um, get their FDA blood work done. Um, and, uh, and then everything else can kind of be done, done where, wherever they live. Uh, doesn't necessarily affect us uh, uh, dramatically um, e either way. So we'll pass the great. Time. Okay, great. Uh, Virginia, for the insurance part of this. The insurance part's going to work exactly the same because your donor and uh, surrogate are going to be US, in the U.S. and U.S. citizens typically. And so it's actually very easy. We just same process. The only difference is if for international intended parents is the baby because the baby, basically, you need to insure the baby. It's your child. It's the minute it's born. Don't think you can put it on the surrogate's insurance because typically in most states it cannot be done. And it also, the, the policy wording on her policy may prohibit it. It just, lots of technicalities and gets into legal stuff. And so I defer to lawyers sometimes. But, and uh, for the most part, you just keep, keep in your brain that you typically are going to have to insure that baby. And there are not a lot of options and the options that are available are expensive. Um, so you just need to keep that in mind. And when you do a consult, we will definitely walk you through what your options are for international to new parents, ensuring the child in the U.S. Great. Fantastic. And the legal part, it's right in your organization's name. So let's, let's hear how it, uh, how it impacts uh, international dads. 
Yeah, um, and so um, I would just like to add on to what Virginia was saying, although I'm not an insurance expert, it is important that if you are from out of the country, that you have this insurance conversation or this conversation about covering the baby's medical bills very early and develop mm -hmm. a plan very early. Um, if there is a plan available, a lot of them have to be activated early in the process. Um, so it's good to research this super early in the process. In terms of how this affects uh, the legal process, it's really important for the lawyers and the clients at the very beginning to understand what the end goal is. And the end goal is to not only be the legal parents, but to go home back to the home country and to be recognized as parents there. And there may be some work that they have to go through when they get back home. We have to know what that work entails, what it looks like, so that we can plan our work here in the US around what needs to be done once they go home. So some examples are, um, if it's a same-sex male couple from Italy, they can't go back home with two men on a birth certificate. We have to put the surrogate on the initial birth certificate with the bio father. And that means we need to make sure the surrogate is okay with that. And we need to make sure that we can get two versions of the birth certificate, one with her on it and one with her off. And so we need to know that early on. So it does, it does mean that the lawyer here in the States needs to have an appreciation for some of the unique issues that these clients will face when going home. And that might mean involving a lawyer in the other country. In most cases, it should. That's the safest way to proceed. It doesn't always mean that you have to engage a local lawyer in the other country. Uh, we certainly work with clients from about 93 different countries. If you need any referrals to lawyers in, in your country, we probably have a list. So please feel free to reach out to us. So that would be the most important part um, of, of considering the strategy for intended parents from other countries when they come here. So just keeping with you for a second, Rich, uh, we've also gotten some questions about doing this domestically and how much it matters where your surrogacy agency is or your fertility clinic is. And I, I think my understanding is it uh, doesn't really matter where the intended parent is. It matters much more where um, some of the other partners in this are. Uh, so can you just talk through a little bit about why that's really important to know the laws in the states uh, and to be working with a competent lawyer that can help you navigate state laws in the U.S.? Sure, sure. So the most important law to you establishing your parental rights and getting the birth certificate or birth certificates in various versions, if you need them, is the law of the state where the birth occurs. That is the most important law that will affect you. Uh, it's not the law of the state where the agency is located or necessarily where the clinic is located, although there are three exceptions. Uh, California, Colorado, and Nevada have statutes that allow you to get your, your parental order there, even if the birth doesn't occur there. The good thing about those three states is they're very LGBT friendly and very, very ART friendly. So you can get your court order there, but you have to ask, your lawyer has to know whether the court order from that state where the procedures occurred will be honored in the state where the birth occurred because it's the state where the birth occurred that will issue the birth certificate. So for the most part, it's the surrogate state that matters although there are some exceptions, three to be specific. Great, uh, anyone else jump in if they have more to add, uh, but I'm gonna move on quickly to this next question, which also impacts all of your areas potentially. Um, but Mark, um, so we had some questions about uh, from a, a potential dad to be who's single. Um, so uh, I would love for each, for each of you to talk about what this process is like for people that are single and going through it, if there's any difference in, in how you approach it with them. Uh, but specifically, Mark, uh, this is a dad to be who says his sperm has been determined to not be viable already. Um, so uh, I'd love for you to talk through like what you may do with someone that approaches you with that uh, in mind or um, you know some ways to see if that's actually true. And uh, just a little bit, you touched on this briefly in your presentation, but just to go a little bit deeper into it. Well, you know, there definitely needs to be more detail because if somebody has sperm in their ejaculate, there is probably viable sperm available in the testes that can be accessed by a testicular biopsy. So for somebody who has a very low sperm count, um, you know, they, they need to see a reproductive urologist and there, that's a very small crew. So I'd, yeah, I'd want to participate in who you should see. I'm not a regular urologist that's mostly seeing old men who can't pee, but somebody who knows a lot about uh, reproductive medicine for men. The other part of the story, sorry, it's just, it's science, right? The other part of the story is that uh, um, uh, there are men that have used anabolic steroids bodybuilding aids and so on. And their sperm count is basically absent because of that. There are men who are on testosterone just for, for low testosterone that's dropped their sperm count. So sometimes we can actually, um, you know, rejuvenate that sperm count, or once again, there can be a testicular procedure to get sperm. So the vast majority of men, unless there's a genetic reason, can be genetic intended fathers, but the 
um, the chances of her pregnancy may be lower. So if you if you're not going to be a genetic sperm source, then you know there's uh, um, there's many many sperm banks out there, and uh, myself and a genetic counselor and a mental health professional would uh, um, help you choose a sperm source. Um, but I think there um, this for this particular gentleman, um, certainly we need more details in order to uh, assess the right answer. Right. So it sounds like don't give up hope just yet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Sam, anything else specific to uh, what a single person needs to be thinking about when working with an agency, matching with a surrogate, yeah. maybe? Yeah. So I think for, for us, you know, we, we support a lot of single parents as they come through this journey. I think one of the things that's important for us as an agency is understanding what your support network is like in the community that you live. You know, as I mentioned during my bit, uh, you know, the mental health aspect of this and the complexity of it and the emotional support, um, the agency can provide a lot of that. Um, but we find often that you know, single, single parents who have a strong familial network or have a strong community they live in um, do a little bit better with that as well because they have other people they can lean on um, at specific points and share the, the joys and you know, some of the complexities with, with on the journey. Um, I think one of the pieces here is you know, if you do end up with a, a sperm donor and an egg donor, um, it is a little bit more difficult to match you with a surrogate because as I'm sure Rich could talk to us about, the state laws with regard to double donor um, get just kind of narrower, a little bit narrower um, on things. So we can find a, we can find you a great carrier, though I'm not worried about that. Um, so uh, we'd love to chat further about it. Great. Uh, Virginia, anything from the insurance perspective? It makes absolutely no difference from an insurance perspective. So <clears throat> bring it on, Easy. you know? Nice yeah. and easy. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, how about the legal side? Yeah, I think Sam just hit on it. If you're uh, doing donor donor, there are a limited number of states that will allow a parental order for uh, someone involved in surrogacy where there's no genetic connection. Some states require a genetic connection, some don't. Um, and so it's important to know, you know, what the states, what states are available to you. Each state will look at marital status um, and, and source of genetics as a sort of precursor to who can get a parental order in that state. So it's important to analyze that before you, you know, work on getting matched. Great. Um, so I regret taking this next question on, but it's an important one we get all the time. So in four minutes, <laughs> I'm going to see if we can talk about twins um, and how this impacts each of your uh, areas, because this is something we hear a lot from. It makes sense if you're a same-sex couple, but you might uh, both want to um, have a child that's biologically connected to you. You see lots of celebrities out there that are gay that have twins. So it's a very common <laughs> question we get. Uh, but it's also, I know, something that's becoming less common within uh, the surrogacy journey world uh, for some very good reasons. So um, uh, why don't we start, Mark, if you could just talk us through a little bit about um, a twin pregnancy, what people need to be thinking about and why it's uh, a little less common than it used to be. Well, um, yes, I can start with that. I want to backtrack for one second. I will tell you about 10, per 10 to 15 percent of my population are single dads to be at this point in time. So if you're thinking about it, you're not alone. Twins. Um, so we, the reproductive medicine industry for the past 20 years, have been responsible for the, the explosion of twins you see in ev everywhere. And the reality is, is that the natural twin rate is about 2%. And then with fertility therapy, it was as high as 30 to 40%. And what do we know about, about the past 20 years of twins is that, that somewhere between 10 to 15% of twin pregnancies are complicated by either preterm birth and medical problems from preterm birth or developmental delay and developmental disability or major birth defects. So by basically about three years ago, our professional society said, IVF has gotten so good, implantation rates per embryo approach 60 to 80%. Let's stop transferring two embryos because it's the best thing for your unborn child from a health point of view. So on the other side of the coin, the surrogates, don't, they don't really wanna be pregnant with twins oftentimes either because they gain more weight, they're more uncomfortable, they have more visits, they have more risk for high blood pressure, diabetes, C-section, cholestasis of pregnancy, and the list goes on. So the pendulum has definitely swung from transferring, you know, three embryos to two embryos to one. And in fact, you know, 92% in our last set of embryo transfers were single embryo transfers. Um, and the reason is, is when I talk to the dads who walk through the door and invariably people want to transfer two embryos, I basically say to them, you know, if you transfer two embryos, there's about a 60% chance you're going to get pregnant with twins. And if those twins occur, I'm going to hope and pray you're, you're the, you know, the 85 to 90% that your kids are well. But if your kids aren't well, that you have a lifelong um, burden to bear for them. 
So, so that being said, you know, taking that in concert, I pose the question back to my dads, you know, do you want to take a, a 10% risk for the health and well-being of your unborn child? And sometimes the answer is, listen, we can only afford to do this once. And we both want to be dads. And uh, so as a practice, we will allow it. Not every practice across the United States will allow dads to be to transfer to embryos. In fact, I get referrals locally now because I'm willing to do it, but we do it with counseling. We do it with education. I believe in patient autonomy. And since the vast majority of twins are healthy and well, and you're gonna love whatever child you have, listen, you can have a singleton baby that, that has, a, has a challenge. So it's a discussion to have, and it's about the health and well-being of your unborn child and your surrogate and everybody's wishes, hopes, and dreams. So that's about as fast as I can bang that. <laughs> Thank you. So in the last uh, 20 seconds, Sam, if you could give us just a quick uh, perspective from the agency. I know something that's becoming more common is uh, what's called the dual journey, right? Well, you'll actually work with two different surrogates simultaneously. Uh, but if you just want to talk through some of the agency considerations quickly, and just as uh, we're signing up, I'm going to, uh, put into our chat function here um, a place where you can sign up for free consultations with each of the uh, team members here. Again, I'm sorry we're not able to get to everyone's questions today. You can email us at dads at gazewithkids.com. Uh, uh, but so as we're, I'm asking each one to sign off and maybe also talk about this particular question <laughs> in doing so. Um, also make sure that you check out their pages on gazewithkids.com where you can learn more and definitely get all your questions answered. So, so uh, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I was just going to add on the, um, on the insurance, or excuse me, on the agency side of things, um, you know, like intended parents who have kind of swung the pendulum towards single embryo transfer, the surrogate population of women that we're having come through to be potential surrogates is much more informed about the potential complications that they might face uh, with twins as well. And so, you know, where we used to have, you know, five years ago, you know, 50% of women willing to carry twins, now that percentage is probably more like 26, 28% of women willing to carry twins. And so, you know, you're shrinking your pool of potential uh, people who would want to carry for you. If you have specific legal considerations that you need and you need a specific state to do a specific thing or a specific insurance environment or a surrogate with specific insurance, and then you layer on also a shrinking population of surrogates that's willing to carry twins, that can sometimes drive your match time um, up to be quite a bit longer. And so there's more complexity on the agency side than that, but I think that's the one that kind of comes top of mind for most folks. Great, so just as I'm asking my panelists to sign off as well, but I'd love to hear from Virginia um, and Rich as well on this issue of twins. Um, uh, take away, Virginia. Um, for international intended parents, I would tell you no, um, mainly because insurance for that baby is going to be almost non-existent or almost $100,000. So hmm. when you weigh that, you can easily try and get into another journey. Um, the other issue is, is that with the prematurity, you, you run the greater risk of being time in the NICU, which can drive up the insurance costs again, or will your insurance cover, et cetera, et cetera. So that all becomes problematic. If you, your surrogate cannot get commercial health insurance and we need to use a Lloyd's of London plan, the deductibles are double. You just really need to think it through. I, I get, I totally get the two for one mentality. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work out the way we believe it should. So that you just really need to think it through. Interesting. I always learn something new on this. That's an interesting wrinkle with the international side. Uh, Rich, anything else you'd add? Um, no, I think most of it's already been said. Uh, there aren't any particular legal considerations that are different for twins versus singleton. But I do want to echo that, you know, the notion that it's two for one is a little short-sighted. If you actually start adding up the numbers and looking at the risks, you can end up spending more even if you do have twins, you might end up with medical problems. So you have special medical needs that you're caring for for the rest of the child's life. Mm -hmm. There goes your budget right there for the rest of your life. Um, you know, you might have a surrogate as well that's on extra bed rest. So you've got more lost wages, more housekeeping, more childcare to reimburse during the surrogacy. So it's not exactly, a, it's, it's, it's almost never a two for one. Um, and I would say, you know, gosh, of, of the twin pregnancies that we've seen through our office, well over half ended up in early birth, really early birth. Oh. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, we could do a whole webinar, I think, just on twins, and maybe we should. Totally, uh, yeah. <laughs> but thank you all again. I'm sorry we went a little bit over. Thank you so much to my panelists, Sam Hyde, Virginia Hart, R uh, Richard Vaughn, and Mark uh, Leandaris. So again, I've put the uh, where you can learn more about each of these panelists, and please do sign up for their consults. They are um, great. Um, it, full of information. You'll get everything, all your questions answered that we weren't able to get to here. Uh, you can also email us at dads at gazewithkids.com. 
Uh, if you're interested in our other um, webinars on the issue of uh, surrogacy, we have our next one um, next week that's going to be on affording surrogacy, which is another topic we could talk about for hours and hours. Um, but so check us out at gayswithkids.com if you haven't already. Sign up for future webinars. We have others on adoption and foster care that'll be coming up soon as well if you're interested in those paths. Uh, thank you again. Happy Pride um, and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.